views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello, everyone, and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Hyman. Today, we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough as well as across New York City. Coming up, we'll update you on the latest with regards to the coronavirus pandemic. And then after that, we're going to talk to Assembly Speaker of the House, Carl Hasty, as he discusses the initiatives that are actually being taken to get food and other necessities to those who are in need during this crisis. And then afterwards, we'll speak with the New York State Senator of District 34, Alessandra Biaggi. She'll be talking to us about New York's unpaused order and the reopening of New York City. And then later, we'll sit with the new commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services, discussing how the organization is providing assistance to help small businesses survive during COVID-19. And then after that, we'll learn about an initiative the Open Society Foundation provides in enhancing protection for refugees and migrants. We'll have more details a little, little bit later on in the show. And then we're going to speak with Bronx Community College representative on details about the fall and summer enrollment and the importance of pursuing an education, especially during these difficult times. So we encourage you to stay with us because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. And hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Open. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, this is Wednesday, May 20th, and you are watching Open, a live program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV sets. We encourage you to stay connected to us on all of our social media platforms at BronxNet TV. While a lot has been going on through the course of this past week, we'll take you through a few things with our Bronx updates. New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo has announced New York State is doubling its testing capacity, reaching 40,000 diagnostic tests per day and launching a website for New Yorkers to find nearest COVID-19 testing site. The governor also announced a state partnership with CVS Pharmacies to begin testing in more than 60 locations statewide. Each pharmacy will have a capacity for at least 50 tests a day. The state's diagnostic testing criteria now includes all individuals who return to the workplace in phase one of the state's reopening plan. New Yorkers eligible for diagnostic testing now include any individual who has COVID-19 symptoms, any individual has not had contact with a person known to be positive with COVID-19, any individual who is subject to a precautionary or mandatory quarantine, or any individual who is employed as a healthcare worker, nursing home worker, or first responder, and any essential worker who directly interacts with the public while working, and any individual who would return to the workplace in phase one of the state's reopening plan. Well, moving on from the state to New York City, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced City MD will provide free coronavirus tests to uninsured New Yorkers. As part of a partnership with New York City aimed at getting tens of thousands of people tested every day. Well, the Urgent Care Company is offering testing at each of its 123 walk-in sites in the area with a capacity of 6,000 PCR swabs per day at its locations. The move puts the city ahead of their goal to be offered 20,000 tests every day by May 25th. Mayor Bill de Blasio stated, we have now hit the goal a week early. We're at capacity now, and we're going to keep growing. Well, in MTA news, the MTA suspends overnight subway service. Many homeless New Yorkers are left on the street or actually congregating in shelters. Our own Bronx Step reporter, Kibben Aline, brings us more details on this story. 
In an effort to protect public health amid the COVID-19 outbreak, Mayor de Blasio and the MTA have suspended overnight subway service for a scheduled daily cleaning. The scheduled 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. shutdown is now sparking conversation on the way New York City is addressing one of their most vulnerable populations, the homeless. A few weeks ago, the mayor and the governor announced that they had decided to shut down the subways overnight. And uh, we immediately were concerned about the thousands of homeless New Yorkers who bed down in the subway system as a means of survival. No one's really been able to answer where homeless New Yorkers are supposed to go. Since the outbreak, New York City public transit has seen an increase of homeless individuals seeking refuge. Policy analyst for the Coalition for the Homeless, Jacqueline Simone, explains why some homeless New Yorkers are seeking shelter within the mass transit system. Many people are on the subways largely because they do not feel safe in the congregate shelters, um, particularly when we have a deadly virus spreading in the shelters, many people do not feel safe there. In an attempt to clear out subways and assist the homeless, Mayor de Blasio announced the progress of a new initiative in collaboration with the MTA, an initiative he says is currently working. Last night when the subway shut down for cleaning, uh, our homeless outreach workers and specially trained members of NYPD were out there to help homeless New Yorkers to offer them a chance to come in and get support 261 homeless individuals were engaged, 139 of them accepted help. 116 went to shelter, 23 went to hospitals. But Simone responds the offering of placement at congregate shelters can cause more harm than good due to overcrowding through shared living, eating, and hygiene spaces. She also reveals the complex issues facing these New Yorkers when met with a decision to accept or decline help. People are being asked, do you want to go to a shelter? And again, many times people have gone to the shelter system and found it did not meet their needs. Um, or if someone accepts the offer and then they're taken to a large intake site and that's not being communicated to them what the process is, you can understand why someone might just walk away. In the midst of a public health crisis, the Coalition for the Homeless says their top priority is making sure homeless New Yorkers have the same protection as anyone else, but expresses that starts with having communication with this vulnerable population. I think this is really indicative of this overall um, failure to engage homeless New Yorkers and asking them what they actually want and need. The Coalition for the Homeless is encouraging the city to offer homeless New Yorkers single occupancy hotel rooms to facilitate appropriate social distancing and self-care. In the meantime, Simone shares they will continue their efforts to provide basic supplies and essential resources for this community. Reporting for BronxNet, Kibben Aline. And thank you, Kibben. BronxNet will continue its coverage regarding the coronavirus pandemic and more when Open continues right after this. Why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. And we're back here on Open. Darren Jaime here with you, where we continue to bring you the news, the information, and the people, and the things that are actually making a difference. When we talk about navigating COVID-19, one of the big challenges is in regards to New York City's homeless. The homeless population continues to grow. Many are infected and many affected. And so New York State Assembly Speaker and also Assembly Member of the 83rd Assembly District, uh, Carl Hasty, has put forward a plan to actually deal with the homelessness issue, uh, particularly prior to COVID-19. But now we want to find out exactly how it's working um, amidst COVID-19. So we're pleased to be joined by the Assembly Speaker uh, for New York State, Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty, also the Assembly Member of the 83rd District, right here in the Borough of the Bronx. And uh, Assemblyman Hasty, Speaker, good to have you. 
How are you, Darren? Thanks for having me. So, um, you know, we had a bold vision that's been going on for years, and it's really been championed by uh, Assemblyman uh, Andy Hepsey, <clears throat> who is our social service chair. Uh, he represents the great borough of Queens. And we always felt um, uh, that, you know, the homeless issue is, as I'd say, well-intentioned as it's been, you know, over the years, it's just the outcomes just don't seem to match that same sense of, uh, of caring. Um, so we came up with a bold idea that if you did more to help people from being homeless, it would be a less costly uh, endeavor uh, um, instead of, uh, you know, um, trying to help people once they, once they become homeless. And so that was a bold plan that we were going to put forward in our one house resolution and hopefully try to negotiate it with the governor and the Senate. But then the world changed, I'd say on around, you know, I'd say March, uh, probably third or fourth when uh, the, uh, you had the first cluster developing in Westchester and it kind of just changed the whole uh, narrative at first, you know, people thought it was just going to be, you know, a flu on steroids, but we're finding that this, uh, uh, virus every day is is affecting new and different uh things and places and people that we had a, no idea that it would affect so in some regard we've had to put the uh, the plan on hold because it did require uh you know funding investment and right now the state is facing a serious uh, 13 to 15 billion dollar deficit the governor's arrested about five billion of that so we're still about eight billion short um but so we need, you know, considerable help from the federal government. And I'd say a lot of what we'd like to do, members have put in a lot of COVID-related bills uh, that require some financial assistance uh, and some that are non-financial. And, you know, we're looking at those bills, but, you know, we're really waiting to see what the federal government is going to be able to do, you know, for hard-hit states. Uh, no state has been hit harder uh, the New York, and I'm not just saying we should get New York uh, favoritism. I mean, I feel like you know we are the greatest state in the union, <laughs> but um, you know, but this, but but no state has gone through what we've gone through. Um, the health disparities, the the fact that uh, we, you know, New York City is the most densely uh, uh, populated city in the in the nation. All of these things fed into the high COVID numbers. Um, so unfortunately we had to put the, the plan on hold for now. Yeah. Yeah. And talk to us a little bit more about, you know, you talk about the Bronx, so you talk about New York city and New York state. Um, and when we talk about issues, food is a big issue. Uh, right. hunger is a big issue. And I know you guys have been partnering, uh, with fresh direct directing, uh, free food to those in need through the operation five bro food drive initiative uh give us a little bit about that and and how that's been actually able to help your district as well as uh you know Bronx. i think during this time um you know you know people who are still you know have their jobs you know they can survive this a little better or they're doing a little better than those who are still waiting for their unemployment benefits or seniors who you know don't want we don't want them going out as much so we've tried to take a mix in all of that, trying to to help the areas in my in my community that I think that have been most affected. Uh, the buildings that we have a lot hard, uh, a large senior population. Uh, again, those who we think that are still waiting for unemployment, the uh, uh, people on the lower income scale. Uh, we've been trying to concentrate on getting uh, food, masks, and hand sanitizer. Um, uh, to uh, to to those we feel are the most vulnerable and most in need. Yeah, yeah. You know, when we talk about those who are most in need, obviously, New York City, New York State seems to be and is the epicenter for uh, this cor coronavirus. A lot of funds being distributed uh, by way of coronavirus. You guys recently passed the budget. Talk to us a little bit about, about that. How hard was it, given the fact that, you know, we've got all these needs here, and um, it's a very tight budget. I know you had some, you know, some some great work in that too. Well, uh, you know, for us in the assembly, we, you know, we prioritize um, um, wanting to have a family's first agenda, particularly trying to put resources in into, you know, areas that help benefit, uh, you know, families. Uh, this, this COVID crisis kind of changed the 
um, uh, like I said, it just seemed from the the second or third, the second week in March, it's like it was a totally different ball game because we saw that uh, it was going to affect uh, the the economy and some of the funds that we thought that would be available, you know, absent uh, tax increases, uh, you know, we had to make adjustments, you know, on on the budget. But we always try to keep our priorities strong. Uh, we wanted to make sure that. Um, uh, in terms in terms of uh, trying to battle, uh, you know, this virus. Uh, it wasn't the budget that, you know, the assembly uh, majority would love, would like to have seen, uh, but it was, you know, one we had to deal with at, you know, during this time. Yeah, yeah. When we talk about money, I mean, obviously we want to ask you about, you know, go back to food for a second. Talk to me a little about the food pantries and how much actually has the state actually allocated towards uh, you know, the, the procurement for these uh, food pantries? I think there was initially, um, and don't 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 uh, hold me to this number, but I think initially in the budget, we had about $60 million statewide uh, for food pantries. And then during the budget, I think we negotiated another $25 million. Um, and I'd say the city would probably see, you know, 40% of that money if I had to give like a, a rough average. Uh, so the city of New York would probably see I'd say an aggregate, um, probably, um, you know, hopefully throughout through all that, we'll probably see about forty million dollars mm -hmm. to help mm -hmm. the food yeah. pantries, the food banks, because the food pantries are the ones in the local, in the local communities. So um, we're trying to get the local food pantries connected with the, you know, the the citywide food banks. So that there could be resources for people in need in communities across the city. Yeah. And the yeah, a little later on in the show, we're going to be talking about small business. And we know that when it comes to small business here, uh, you know, the funds that were supposed to be making its way towards New York, 70 percent goes to New York City. Um, you know, the Bronx left out. Your thoughts on that and, and, and how do we correct this here? Well, I think, again, you know, I think the federal government is well-intentioned in trying to uh, make sure that you can get, uh, you know, money to um, to those businesses. I remember a conversation I had uh, with Senator Schumer at the beginning of this pandemic. I said, you know, the federal government is really going to have to subsidize people's lives, I'd say, for the next, you know, few months, a year until, you know, something turns the corner in terms of this COVID, you know, virus, whether we get a vaccine, whether we get a, uh, you know, a real treatment, um, you know, it's up to the federal government and, and, you know, and he agreed. But the problem is you have, you know, for the big, you know, major companies, they have entire accounting firms that have the ability to put together these applications. They usually work with the big, you know, with the big banks. Um, but I think there needed to be uh, a little more of a, community and, uh, you know, and uh, minority owned business focus. And they tried to do that in the second, uh, uh, well, what was that? The third stimulus uh, uh, bill where they tried to put a set aside in, but uh, clearly as we can all see uh, more work still needs to be done in terms of helping out the, the, the mom and pop shops, uh, particularly those that are minority owned. Yeah. Before I let you go, I want to ask you one final question about the census. I mean, there's a lot of concern mm -hmm. about the census. When we look at COVID-19, we know that it disproportionately affects communities of color. When we talk about the census, we know that communities of color are sometimes underrepresented in terms of numbers. Any concern on your part with regards to, um, you know, the census, given the fact that we've got this going on right now, the reporting of numbers and what that could mean economically for the state? Right. You know, if, if as you've heard the governor say that New York is a donor state, which means we give more money to the federal government than we get back. Um, and, you know, for, you know, for every person that fills out the census, it's more federal dollars that gets directed back. So um, that's why it's important for people to uh, respond to the census. I think uh, New York only had about 67% uh, 10 years ago. So that means only two out of every three people in the um in the state uh you know responded well there was a res uh, respondents per household um in terms of um responding to the census so we want to build on that uh you know it, it hurts representation it hurts direct funding 
uh, because remember, congressional seats are drawn based on states' population. So if New York is behind the eight ball in terms of in comparison with other states in the nation uh, that do a better job, uh, there's projections of saying that we could lose two members of Congress. Um, but I would say if the state had, you know, had a robust census, you know, maybe we can move it down to just one uh, one uh, congressional seat that has to be uh, um, uh, that we would lose. Yeah. All right. Well, we got to leave it there. It's great having you on and sharing with us. Here Always. On Open. And, uh, you know, we've been doing this for years. You know, you've got an open door here. Come on back anytime. Uh, New York State Assembly Speaker, Carl Hasty. Thanks so much. All right. Stay safe until all your viewers and everyone watching. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Socially distance. Wear those masks out in public. Take nothing for granted. Um, we should all become, um, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, probably the cleanest and most hygienic <laughs> that we've ever been in our lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. Speaker Hasty, good to have you. All right. Take care. All righty. Take care. Okay. Now, we listen, we got more open. We want you to stay with us. We're coming right back, right after this. It looks bleak. It feels bleak. But the city isn't shut down because our public services keep working. In spite of and in the face of the dangers, we can count on them. And to keep them working and funded now and in the future, we need to be counted. Self-respond now to the 2020 census at my2020census.gov. And thank you for staying with us. Well, New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo has extended the pause order for certain regions that have not necessarily met the criteria and the benchmarks for reopening. That includes New York City as well as Westchester County. And many people wonder if we are also opening too soon. Here to give us more information and provide further insight is the 34th District New York State Senator, Alessandra Biaggi. And we thank you so much for being with us again, Senator Biaggi, uh, and sharing with us here on Open. Thank you for having me. I am very happy to be back. The last time that we spoke was like right at the beginning of this. So a lot has happened yeah. since then. Yeah, a lot has happened since then. And I mean, in, in, in some ways good. And, and of course we know uh, the mortality rate, but uh, let's talk about some good news in some sense. Some people are happy about the fact that certain areas are reopening and other people have still have a lot of skepticism. Uh, your thoughts on the reopening? So listen, I think that the fact that we are going region by region, making sure, you know, the governor's um, New York forward plan has a whole set of seven metrics that have to be met before a region can be open. Um, decline in total hospitalizations, decline in deaths, new hospitalization rates, hospital bed capacity, um, diagnostic testing capacity, um, contact tracing capacity, ICU bed capacity, all of the, the metrics that we know um, have really been at the front of um, our, our ability to deal with the crisis region by region, especially in New York City and Westchester County. And so it's a smart approach to go region by region. Um, what I will say is that um, I think that um, where we are, right, it's about to become summer. The weather is changing. People feel like they've been inside for so long and they're just really like truly wishing to get out of their homes, to be in the parks, to go to the beach. And I understand that because I am one of those people who really has that desire to do those things as well. But my number one priority is always to keep people safe. And so there is there is part of what we are experiencing right now, um, which is the balance between the desire to leave our homes, but also making sure we don't have that second surge of cases. We want to really make sure people are safe. And there is a part of me that feels, you know, I'm a very... Um, progressive thinker, open-minded, very much um, forward-facing, future-oriented. But when it comes to this, when it comes to our, our lives and the safety of our communities, um, I have a more conservative approach. And I do feel like there is um, the, that the urgency and the public push, um, while it's real and I understand it, at the same time, I really do think that there's, there's this fast opening in certain areas that I'm concerned about for the long term, because when we look at the whole state, yes, upstate and you know some of the regions that are gonna that were already reopened and, and phase one, they don't have as many cases. There's not as many people who live there. I get it, but the message that we send um, is one that okay, yeah, like we're you know we're getting back to quote unquote normal. Well, there is no normal, right? Like we are in mm -hmm. a different world now, and we know that. But more importantly, 
we don't have a, a vaccine. We don't have a cure. Um, we still do not know um, much about this disease. A lot of doctors that I've spoken to are still in, the, in the, the position where they say it's so different from each person to person. Even though we say young people you know, are not as affected, we see young people die just like that. Right. And so there's so much that we still don't know. And I, am, I have taken a really conservative approach. And I am concerned that we are opening too quickly, especially because the governor announced that on Memorial Day, beaches outside of New York City will be reopened. I mean, it's very hard to patrol beaches when people are sitting as close to each other um, as we know that they do on a beach. And if you have people who are have been inside who want to get to that beach, you're going to have a lot of people who are on the beach together. And again, um, we are not out of the woods yet. So the plan is a good plan, but um, I have a more conservative approach to how we, I believe we should reopen. Uh, yeah, and, and talking about small business for a minute, because I want to talk about this reopening. Because here in the borough of the Bronx, we know that there is this sense of desperation on the part of Bronx business owners, uh, given the fact that there's this new small business package that's supposed to be coming. But we know the first time uh, that when the appropriations came, 70% of that went to the Bronx, and you had the Bronx saying, literally, we've been robbed. And in my estimation, you have to have something in order to be robbed. But, you know, think about it. We never even had the money and the funds for small business. So, so talk about your, uh, talk about the small business package. Are you optimistic that it's actually going to come with boots on the ground to the borough? You know, you, you said something that is right on, which is that um, the, the borough of the Bronx has not had um, its fair share of the pie ever in my particular opinion. And so when it comes to this crisis and you have businesses who've been there for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, or you have new businesses who have an entrepreneurial spirit who've opened up because they see the Bronx um, as this place where there's opportunity, which it is a borough of opportunity. Um, and then you look at the, you know, what the federal government has done in terms of providing assistance. Um, it's not enough. It's not enough in so many ways. So you have the, the PPP program, right? The Paycheck Protection Program um, and, and the Health Care Enhancement Act. Um, it was passed into law at the federal government, at the federal level. It was signed into, into law by the government. Um, it was a $484 billion bill with $310 billion, $310 billion for small businesses, um, including 10 million, excuse me, 10 billion for administrative costs. So what does that mean? It, what it meant in the first phase was that all of those businesses, right, the small businesses who had the ability to apply for the program, navigate the government, have resources to do it, got to the front of the line, got the money that they needed, and were able to keep their businesses open. A lot of other businesses, especially businesses in the Bronx, um, even if they had applied, they were at the, you know, the back of the line. Um, a lot of people in the Bronx, we, have, we don't talk about this enough, do not have access to public banking. And so when you think about that, it means that if you have to apply for this program through a bank and you don't have access to public banking or you you bank in another way, you are then prevented from accessing that resource. And that's what we saw. We saw a lot of like the bigger businesses, the more established businesses getting that money. Ruth's Chris, right? The right. Steakhouse, right. Eating up the funds. They don't need that money. Give me a break. And so, but then you have you know, the Riverdale Steakhouses of the world um, and, and the small bodegas not even able to eat, to even be on the line. There are 100,000 in terms of a waiting list. That's where they are um, on the list. And that is, is for many different reasons, one of which I already mentioned. The second of which is that information flow from the federal government, the state government, the city government to businesses has been a massive challenge for me, for a lot of uh, elected. So, when I when I'm able to communicate with my community, even though I have email addresses and and we have those email addresses through the Board of Elections, I don't have the email addresses of every small business in District 34. That means that I have to do independent outreach, which I love to do and which we have done. But the point I'm trying to make is that's a delay in the ability for me to get to do my job, to, which is to provide information of how these small businesses can access the grants and the loans and the ability to get these resources um, that they need in order to survive. And so. You know, of of the money that we see and that we have seen through the PPP, even though there have been two waves, right? After the first wave of money ran out, there was a second wave of money that was given, um, and we saw a lot more businesses who were waiting have access to it. 
still, still, we see businesses who do not have access to the funds or are still waiting for the funds. And so last week, we know that the House of Representatives passed um, another bill, um, another large stimulus bill, um, protection for um, small businesses, protection for um, local governments, protection for essential workers, protection for testing and tracing, all of the things that we think are the important metrics that will allow for people to survive, small businesses to survive. And yet, we don't know if this bill is going to pass through the Senate because at the because the U.S. Senate is, of course, led by Republicans. And we've seen time after time the Republicans in the Senate claw back so much of the protections that we know help our our small businesses, our working families. And these are the people that are on the ground in the Bronx just waiting for something so that they can be able to come through this crisis and survive it. It's not even about flourishing. It's about surviving so they can keep their brick and mortar that the, the community relies on because they are the critical infrastructure holding up the walls of, uh, of the community and, and the community loves them and wants them to come back. And it has been just such a challenge to get them what they need. Now, on the state level, on the city level, there has also been money that has been distributed. There are entrepreneurial resource centers. There's Empire State Development who has provided um, resources. But still, people are not used to navigating government. It is not a common exercise. And so part of my job has been really bridging the gap and it has been a challenge. And so we tried um, to do everything that we can and we're gonna continue to do it, but believe me, there's a lot more that still can be done. Right, well, we're getting ready to wrap up real quickly, but let me just ask you this question. Uh, question. It's really a long, I mean, a, a short question, but I, I can't get a long answer on this one here, but talk to me about the rent and the housing issues. Do you feel as though things are getting better or worse? I think things are getting worse, to be perfectly honest with you. We know in March, the governor issued a, um, a moratorium on rent, a pause on rent for 90 days, right? That that has since been extended um, beyond those 90 days. And, and that's all well and good. But a moratorium on rent, which is a pause on rent, is just that. You have to pay it back after the pause is lifted. And so right. we don't want families to be burdened by this commercial businesses, residential tenants. There's also been a lot, you know, relief for mortgage pay payments as well. Um, there are bills in the New York State Senate um, that I have signed on to to provide um, real relief so that we can cover the cost of rent, cover the cost of mortgages and make sure that all of our families are not homeless. Um, are able to stay in their homes. Businesses are able to stay where they are. And we are TBD on that. And that is why I am calling to make sure that the legislature goes back into session digitally on Zoom, just like the Congress has done, just like other the city council has done. So we can get to work legislatively, pass these bills, deliver them to the governor's desk and provide real relief for New Yorkers. All righty. Well, we got to leave it there. New York State Senator Alessandra Biaggi, thank you so much for being with us, giving us the latest. And of course, we'll have to stay tuned and stay connected to you to find out what's happening. Uh, and of course, uh, we've always got so many things happening across the city. We'll definitely need to get your input soon. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me and all that you do. Oh, thank you, Senator Biaggi, our guest here on Open. Listen, I need you to stay with us. We do have more show coming up. We'll be right back right after this. Who is most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65. People with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. And hey, welcome back here to Open. Darren Jaime here with you. We thank you for staying with us. As we continue the coverage of the pandemic and the coronavirus crisis, small businesses have been front and center and have been affected dramatically uh, through the coronavirus. Many have been forced to shut down and lay off workers. The NYC Department of Small Business Services are actually providing assistance to help those that are in place, assisting local businesses and its employees during this crisis. And here now to share a little bit more and provide further insight is the new commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services, Janelle Doris. And uh, Janelle, good to have you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. And congratulations. You were uh, just recently appointed. And uh, so how's it been uh, in your new appointment? Well, I must say that we're very excited um, to join uh, the Small Business Services Department. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but I, I ran the uh, Minority and Women-Owned Business Enterprise uh, Office for the Mayor's Office for the last uh, several years as the city's first 
such a, a senior advisor and director. So this is uh, an out uh, sort of outfit of my role, sort of uh, another opportunity for me to help uh, small businesses across the city. Um, and very excited to be in the role. And we just hit the ground running, right? It's a, I'm a weekend, um, and uh, I'm happy to be here talking to you about some of the things that we have done. So let me ask a question about the, uh, you know, because on the hearts and minds of a lot of Bronxites particularly are about the, the COVID relief loans. And so yeah, yeah. Uh, small businesses, and particularly we have spoke to several Chamber of Commerce, others who have extreme concerns because uh, the Bronx has seemed to be excluded when it came to that. About 70 percent went to the city uh, and the Bronx left out. What can we expect this time around? Yeah, you know, so we started off uh, with our employee retention loan uh, program, uh, grant program, and also a business continuity loan program. Uh, we did extensive outreach across the city and, you know, really was able to assist businesses and get into those loan funds. Um, then that was really a stopgap, right, because this problem was so big and enormous that we really needed a federal response. I mean, this is unprecedented. It's something we've never had before. And so what we've pivoted to is resourcing our MWBEs, our small businesses, our mom and pop shops uh, to get uh, really access to the federal grants and the federal loans. And I think that is really where, the, where it's key for us, right? We have 240,000 businesses uh, uh, in the state that received about 40 billion dollars uh, of loan funds from the federal government. So listen, they have the resources uh, and we pivoted our operations to help our MWBE small businesses and our uh, mom and pop shops to get those funds. Um, and they're getting those funds and really at a tune um, that we are very, very happy with. So the challenge again before was when we started the program and we rolled it out, we did the outreach, we spoke to those businesses, we we worked with the Chambers of Commerces, we worked also with the bids, we worked with several of our uh, partners in the Bronx and around the city. Um, are we happy with sort of how the borough uh, dis the disparity is playing out? No. And that's why we zeroed in on it and we began to really, really focus on uh, how do we do some increased outreach uh, for those businesses? How do we get them connected with the uh, SBA loan products that are out there? Uh, and really the PPP, which is really uh, the key for them to be successful right now, that's the product that we have everyone going to. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about that PPP, a lot of people are looking forward to hopefully seeing uh, some, some, some uh, resolve with that. But businesses really, as I said, many of them are going to be forced to close their doors. Many of them are going to be uh, shutting down. I know that that's not what you want to see happen. So talk to us about what opportunities and what businesses can do. If I've got, I, I, we've got business owners that watch our show all the time. Uh, what would you tell them and what would be your advice? Yeah, listen, we, we understand the pain that's out there, right? I think in part is our job as a city agency to really deal with the realities of what our businesses are feeling. So again, one of the greatest things that we've heard and so the most important things that we've heard, the greatest need uh, from our small businesses is information. Uh, if you don't have the right information, you can't make the right application. You can't go and do the loan, uh, apply for loans or grant programs and so forth and so on. So we've been doing that. We've been giving them the information that they need, the technical assistance and support services that they need in order for them to be successful. And we've been doing that uh, at a, really at a high pace on a weekly basis. Um, we are pushing out 15 or so of those. We're doing it in different languages. We're giving them information about private sector opportunities. We're giving them information about city opportunities. We're giving them uh, information about the federal opportunities. And so there's two things. One, yes, you can sell to uh, in the private sector, but there's also government that you can work with. Um, you know, I ran the NWBE program for the city. And what that is, is we contract with minority women-owned businesses to actually provide services for the city. If you're a minority or women-owned business, you can sign up with us, get certified, and join our program. That's another way for you to stay open as uh, using, I'm sorry, using government as one of your uh, resources and as a client. And so we're trying to get folks to think differently, to really think outside the box. Just don't sell to other businesses or customers. You got to think about government as, as also another resource. Yeah. And government is definitely that resource. I think a lot of people are trying to look to these days uh, because it is for many uh, the last the last, the last resource. resource 
of, uh, 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 of help. So let's real quickly go through what is probably the most prominent program that we could probably get business owners connected to that they maybe, maybe not be so familiar with, but may need to tap into. Yeah. I, again, I, I think when you, when you're asking about where the funds are, uh, where the money is, uh, where the resources are right now, uh, the city has, as you can, as you heard, like an eight billion dollar def, uh, uh, a deficit right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we are tapping in again to the federal resources to get the resources to the businesses. So if your business needs help, I'm going to give you our, our our website. When you go on that website, it is very clear. It is right direct to our COVID relief efforts, and it also outlines. Uh, where you can see the webinars, where you can get the assistance, where you can get the real life uh, touch of individuals who can help you. So it is nyc.gov, nyc.gov forward slash COVID-19 biz, B-I-Z. And that will take you directly to where our resources are. Okay. Well, we'll have to leave it there on this particular segment. Got to bring you back so that way you can be able to share a little bit more with us. Let us know exactly what's going on at the Department of Small Business Services. As we know, small business is the lifeblood of America. And here in New York City, and particularly in the borough of the Bronx, uh, a lot of businesses definitely uh, clinging by a thread. And so trying to make it through, yeah, I believe we're going to get through. But thank you for the great work that you're doing. Congratulations. Uh, And hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to you soon. Well, thank you so much for having me and I look forward to working with you and all the small businesses out there. Please note uh, that we are here for you. We want to make sure that you have the resources that you need. Just reach out to us on our website. We will be here to take care of the challenges that you face right now. Okay. Well, Janelle Doris, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us here. Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, sir. All righty. And we will continue as we've got more open coming up. We encourage you to stay with us. We've got more show coming up right after this. Here on Open, Darren Jaime here with you as we continue talking about all the things concerning COVID-19. And when we talk about COVID-19, one of the things that we need to discuss is that of migrant workers, refugees, and how this all impacts. And so we're pleased to be joined by Lane Romero Olson, who's the team manager of International Migration Initiative for the Open Societies Foundation of New York City. And uh, Lane, good to have you. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And so as we talk a little bit about this, I I want you to walk us through because um, we talk about a lot of affected and impacted groups. And when it comes to migrant workers, definitely uh, sometimes they fall between the cracks. But I know that you're front and center with boots on the ground, able to deal with them. Yeah, most definitely. And when we talk about um, some of the most vulnerable workers, well, workers who have been working hard um, well before COVID-19 hit, workers who are caring for our families as domestic workers and home health aides, or workers who are um, now delivering uh, our food to those of us who have the ability to stay home during this time, or workers who are stocking our warehouses or um, still working in the grocery stores that enable us to um, um, still uh, eat and go and stock up when we need to. Um, Some of these workers are workers who've been um, for a long time working hard, but work hasn't really um, helped to make ends meet. They've been working with low wages oftentimes and um, under uh, under dangerous conditions before. Um, And when COVID-19 came, Uh, In many cases, they are still working, but without the kind of protections, um, whether it be health protections, um, paid leave, or um, what they call the protective equipment to be able to go to work and be and be safe. And then many workers um, lost their jobs, as we know, uh, when um, when COVID-19 hit and didn't have 
uh, paid leave or didn't have savings to fall back on. Um, they're now called essential workers, which is right. amazing that we understand their importance to our economy and our society, and yet they're not necessarily getting the kinds of supports. And many of those workers are also um, immigrants, immigrants, whether they um, be uh, migrant workers, um, or whether they be immigrant workers who've been living here for a long time, um, uh, whether it be with with uh, uh, documentation or undocumented workers, as well as, re as refugees. And unfortunately, um, many of these workers are not eligible for the kinds of uh, relief that is coming from the federal government um, through unemployment insurance or through the stimulus checks that um, some of us are fortunate to get, uh, some of us are fortunate to get to help us ride out um, this right. time. So when you talk about filling in those gaps, right? So you're talking about they're not getting stimulus checks. Yep. Uh, you know, the, the, the money's not coming to them and they definitely are in need. So I know you're trying to be a bridge and you have worked to be a bridge. How are you bridging the gap for those who've been affected like this? So Open Society Foundation is partnering with the city of New York um, as well as multiple cities across the country, about 20, including a few counties and states, to set up um, funds that are um, private funds through uh, funds like the foundations like Open Society Foundations and other kinds of foundations and individual donors, but are in partnership with the city who, um, who we believe are um, critical to responding to the needs of their communities and the people in need right now to be able to, um, and then also working with community-based organizations that have long track record and history and trust and relationship who um, are able to provide services in multiple languages with cultural competency to be able to provide one-time cash assistance um, supports to workers who are otherwise excluded from the stimulus and their families. So um, for example, in New York, we were able to um, provide uh, $20 million to the Mayor's Fund for the City of New York, which is a uh, a partner foundation to the city who will be contracting and supporting, partnering with um, about 30 different community-based organizations that are in communities and communities, various communities of the Bronx or Upper Manhattan or Queens or Staten Island or Lower Manhattan that the communities know and, and trust so that they can be able to reach out to the communities they've been serving for a long time and will continue to be serving um, after uh, this period that we're living. Um, be able to do the kinds of assessment um, of eligibility for this assistance and provide both that support, but also connect folks to other kinds of supports that they might be eligible for um, and that they'll be needing um, in addition to the cash assistance. Right. Well, Lane, before we go, please, for there may be migrant workers out there. There may be people who are saying, listen, I, I want to get connected. I want to find out more information. How do they go about getting connected to you in a time such as this? Yeah, um, they should call the city, the mayor's office of Immig immigrant affairs has a hotline. The number is 212-788-7654. They also have an email, which is askmoya, so A-S-K-M-O-I-A at cityhall.nyc.gov. And really it, it, um, folks should reach out to them um, to be able to find the, the access to the community-based organizations and in, in, that are closest to your region. That's the best way to find out more information and to hopefully get access to these kinds of resources. Well, Lainey, thank you so much. I believe that we'll get people connected and you shared a lot today and hopefully uh, people can tap in and continue the great work that you're doing with migrant workers and immigrants the whole nine yards. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for your really important reporting on this. Thank you, Lenny Romero Alston, our guest here on Open. Watch you stay with us because we've got more show coming up right after this. We're coming out of the other side. So in many ways, from my point of view, we're on the other side of the mountain. You have to be New York tough, smart, United, disciplined, loving. This is the next big step in this historic journey. We talk about being New York tough and what 
tough really means? We changed the trajectory dramatically by what we did. What we have done thus far is really amazing. And that was smart, but we have to stay smart. And welcome back here to Open. Darren Jaime here with you. For many college students, the coronavirus has had to transcend the way that they learn, adapting to moving remotely. And with the summer and fall semesters that are now incoming, the question on the hearts and minds of many is, how are the upcoming plans going to affect BCC students, students at Bronx Community College? Here to join us to share a little bit more is the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, for Bronx Community College, we're pleased to be joined by Lester Sandres Ropolo. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you so much, Darren. I'm so humble and so honored for this wonderful opportunity. I want to say thank you to your team. I want to say thank you first and most to our wonderful Bronx Community College students. We do everything in our hands to make sure that we feed the pedagogical needs in every way, shape, or form. And on that note, I also want to say thank you to our chancellor, Dr. Felix Matos, our president, Terrell Blazer, our leader, Dr. Thomas Sekenegby, our vice president for student success, Dr. Irene Delgado, and our vice president, Eddie Bayardell from the foundation and assistant vice president, Richard Ginsburg. Without their help and support, we will not be able to transition and move our entire platform from face to face to online. But you know, Darren, Nothing would be possible without the help of the New York State Assembly members, Victor Pichardo and Natalia Fernandez. They were able to help us literally to secure and deliver more than 900 devices to our students' home to assist them in their distance learning modality. When we move our entire portfolio literally from face-to-face -to, -face to an online modality or distance learning modality, that's when we show our commitment to our student. And it's not only just moving the courses, it's providing the right tools. And with that, I wanna say thank you to our faculty members, our staff, everyone that supported us to make this happen, our tutors, our mentoring, all the services that we provide at uh, uh, Browns Community College, our phone bank, we have a phone bank making hundreds hundreds of calls during this pandemic to check on students and encourage them to register for the summer and fall courses. Yeah, and so we talk about registering for the summer and fall courses. Obviously, summer school is right around the corner. Uh, and then you've also got fall courses. For students navigating through COVID-19 and getting to the online platform, uh, how hard has it been? What have you heard from students with regards to making that transition? Because for some students, uh, online learning is not the easiest thing. Absolutely. I agree with you 100 percent. At Bronx Community College, thanks to the leadership of our vice president of a student uh, success, Dr. Irene Delgado, and our president, everything that we do, it's a student center and a student focus. So we make sure that we call them. We have tutors, we have mentors, we have our faculty members literally email them, making phone calls and checking on them and say, hey, what can we do to help you? We need you, we need you to get to the finish line and we're here for you. So anything that we do at Bronx Community College, it's a student center and make sure that not only help them to get to the finish line, but also to start thinking about enrolling in the uh, summer and fall semester. So we provide the right tools, the right uh, mentorship, the right um, devices, and that way they can transition to distance learn because you will have to understand a lot of our students do not have uh, some of them they don't have devices uh, computer laptops or the or computer devices to actually do their homework so thanks to the leadership of our our chancellor dr felix matos and the assembly members Pichard and fernandez we were able to to secure devices to provide to our students in grading needs so we care for them. Everything that we do at Bronx Community College is because we, we care for them and we invested in their, in their commitment, right? So think about how our students are increasing their personal wealth, right? Social mobility, right? That's what Bronx Community College is stand for. We have been identified as number six in the nation of two-year public colleges for having the highest mobility rate. That shows the commitment that we have. And now more than ever, we need our students to continue pursuing their career and their education. 
Lester, can, you ju- can I jump in for a second? If somebody doesn't know exactly what social mobility is, how do you define social mobility? What is that? You know, that's a great question. So I'm going to explain it to the best of my ability, right? Having been a first-generation Latino, Hispanic, and coming to the United States, uh, not knowing English, not knowing how to navigate the system, I can relate to the students, to a lot of our students. We represent more than 100 different languages, uh, cultures, and so forth. So social mobility is when you become a change agent in your family, and you get a, you get an education, and you move from a social economic status, whatever that income might be, it can be $15,000, it can be $20,000, to a higher bracket, right? So that doesn't come out of thin air. That comes because you devoted time, you devoted your time to study and get a degree. And to show you, we have programs that truly pay their dividends uh, in more, more than one uh, form. We At Bronx Community College, we offer more than 40 academic major certificate programs, associate in arts degree, associate in applied sciences, associate in art degree. We have our radiology technology, uh, medical laboratory technicians, uh, or known, better known as M- MLT and RAT tech. We have nursing programs, business, STEM, business. So all these programs help students to move their economic uh, uh, income from point one to a point two, right? Or let's say hypothetically from a $15,000 income to a higher degree, 25, 30, 50 in some cases, right? So at Bronx Community College, we not only prepare, we not only inspire, but we empower our students so they can continue in the best education possible. Yeah. Less than one, thank you for coming and sharing with us uh, a lot going on at Bronx Community. I'm glad to know it. And for you, uh, who's been a student yourself, obviously, uh, just real quickly, um, for you being a, who's been a student and now you see students uh, trying to navigate through this, what's the best advice you want to give them? That's an excellent question, Darren. You know, the best advice that I can give to our students um, is to invest time in their education to come to Bronx Community College. We have a team devoted 100% of their time for them, to give back to them. We're here because we care for you. We want to make sure that you change our communities, that you become a person that will contribute to society in one or more than one way, shape, or form. Uh, we truly believe in your talent. And um, we don't only, I, I don't like to say that Bronx Community College, it provides hope. We provide you the tools, the skills that you need in order to compete in the global market. One of the things that I want to say is that we have to be very careful when we talk about this, right? When our parents competed uh, many, many years ago, right, they Mm -hmm. competed at a regional level. My generation, and I'm dating myself, we competed at a national level. Our students now, more than ever, they competed at an international level. So at Bronx Community College, we are aware of that, and we do everything possible to make sure that we provide them with the right tools, the right instruments, and with scholars. We have enormous time. I'm going to have to leave it here because I'm out of the show, but I definitely want to thank you because I got to get out of here before they tell me that, uh, you know, show's wrapping. But no, let's. Thank you so much for sharing with us and continue the great work. I know that you've been at BCC for a few months and you're, you know, ultra excited about the things that are going on. We're excited as well as you continue to lift up students at Bronx Community College. Lester Rapolo, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Darren. Have a wonderful All- day. All righty, listen. And I uh, want to let you know that about wraps it up for this edition of Open. Now, listen, uh, if you missed any part of today's Open, you can catch the Recablecast at 5 and 8 p.m. on Bronx's Channel 67. Uh, if you don't have that, Verizon Files will be Channel 33 or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. For all of us here on the set of Open, I am Darren Jaime saying take care. Keep this channel wide open. And Rena Valentin will be back on Friday with a brand new episode. So everybody stay cool, stay safe, social distance. Until then. <laughs>